National Review. I want to welcome Kevin Williams into the program. Kevin, thank you, sir, for joining us today. Always a pleasure. It's good talking with you again as well, and uh, I really appreciate uh, your piece, A Pincher Movement on Ammunition. Uh, as you say, um, you know, in order to write about this subject, you have to get into the weeds a little bit, and I know that that might turn off uh, some readers. Oh, too long, didn't read it. But uh, but this is important stuff here. I mean, as you say, the Obama administration on uh, on one side, you've got the ATF going after uh, some of the most common AR ammunition. On the other side, you've got groups who are trying to use the EPA to go after lead ammunition, uh, the end result of which would be uh, a, a, a much more difficult, if not uh, nearly impossible situation for gun owners to get affordable uh, ammo in any quantities whatsoever. Yeah, so you've got a bunch of um, rounds that are not lead-based, which are potentially uh, classified as armor-piercing rounds because they're not lead. So you've got steel and uh, other alloy uh, rounds that can be classified as armor-piercing. On the other side, you've got the EPA and environmental groups and possibly the Department of Interior and some others trying to outlaw lead-based ammunition on environmental grounds because lead's a toxin and because it's bad for things like uh, condor, uh, allegedly, uh, which can, you know, eat carrion that's been been killed with a, a lead-based round. So you've got, I mean, to start with, the entire federal idea of armor-piercing ammunition is silly and ridiculous because it's not about bullets that are designed to pierce armor. It's about bullets that could defeat sort of soft body armor that was prevalent among law enforcement agencies back in the 1980s when the law was passed. But of course, to get that done, you had to exempt basically all rifles, especially hunting rifles, because, you know, your granddad's 30-06 deer gun is going to pull mm-hmm. in uh, you know, this sort of soft body armor. To say nothing if you've got a 458 or a big game rifle or something like that. So, you know, if you're a moose hunter or a bear hunter or an arrow caribou hunter, you've got a rifle at home that's going to, you know, defeat body armor of of most kinds. So the rule that they passed was it had to be uh, something that could both defeat the body armor and that you could put into a handgun. There were handguns on the market for. And then, of course, they exempted uh, single shot and bolt action handguns. So you've got, you know, these Thompson handguns that'll shoot, you know, most rifle rounds. Uh, They're very configurable. So that takes us down to this very narrow category of non-lead-based bullets in rifle cartridges that you can fire in a commonly available handgun, which takes us basically now down to the AR-based handguns that have come onto the market in the last couple of years, which are themselves uh, nothing other than a response to another set of regulations, that being the short-barreled rifle rules. So as you know, you've probably been over this a million times. If you buy an AR without a stock, if it comes out of the factory with no stock and a short barrel, that's a handgun. If you buy one and you put on a short barrel and take off the stock, then you've made an illegal weapon. It's physically exactly the same thing, but it depends on, on how it came out of the factory. So, you know, my personal view on this is that AR handguns are pretty well near useless, but people buy them as substitutes for getting a short barrel rifle permit, which, you know, you have to do an additional check and stamp and all that stuff for right but some people like them and so it's a way to have a short barreled you know very maneuverable ar uh type rifle uh handgun right there even though it's not really a handgun it's uh, it's classified as one so you can probably guess these are just never used in crimes i mean this is always presented as we have to do this we have to uh, regulate this armor piercing ammunition in these ar based handguns to uh to save the lives law enforcement officers who may be wearing body armor that could be defeated by this. But, of course, the most common handguns and the most common guns at all used in crimes are also just the most common guns. And these aren't really very common. In fact, they are so rarely used in crimes that, so far as I can tell, there isn't any law enforcement agency that even bothers to track them. And you can imagine why. They're fairly expensive. They're big. You know, it's got the magazine out front, the same as the rifle does, so it's not super easy to conceal or anything like that. And most people who are committing, you know, street crimes who end up in confrontations with police and things like that don't tend to have a lot of high-end expensive stuff. You know, a lot of them are drug addicts and people involved in that sort of uh, 
milieu, and if they had something that was worth $1,000 or $2,000 or $3,500, they would have sold it by then. So they're just, it's not something that's ever very commonly used in crimes. It's not something that's used to shoot a law enforcement agents. In fact, I wasn't able to find a single incident, the one being used to shoot a police officer, although I'm sure if you looked hard enough, you could find one, but I spent half a day looking and I couldn't turn one up. So it's a completely nonsensical solution to a problem that doesn't exist. And it's really just, you know, part of what I think is just an overall broader move within the federal government to move away from focusing on particular designs and models of firearms to go after the ammunition instead. So they're not going to ban outright uh, lead-based bullets, I think, any time in the near future, although they're banned for hunting in a lot of places now, Mm -hmm. uh, which makes their commercial use and availability less. And uh, they won't ban necessarily all 223 uh, ammunition, but they're going to just keep enacting, you know, ever finer and more cumbrous regulations until one hand, it's going to be really hard to get lead-based ammunition. On the other hand, it's going to be really hard to get non-lead-based ammunition for different reasons. But it comes to the same end, which is it makes it very, very difficult, if not impossible, to get ammunition uh, with the idea that you're going to create enough of a hassle both for buyers and retailers and wholesalers to make it a less attractive business and sort of slowly uh, weaken it and drive it down. Yeah, I mean, in a way, um, and, you know, facetiously, I'll say I blame uh, Chris Rock, Kevin, uh, because, you know, he had his stand-up routine (laughs) years and years ago, right, about we don't need gun control, we just need to make uh, ammunition cost $1,000 a bullet. Um, uh, Ammunition certainly wouldn't be $1,000 a round, but uh, but it would be harder to find. Uh, and it would be uh, it would be more expensive um, if the uh, administration has their way. And again, you know, we saw President Obama say that he wanted to take these sorts of executive actions after uh, Congress didn't. Uh, they rejected the uh, the gun control bills that uh, that he had put forth after the murders at Sandy Hook Elementary. We have a couple of more years here, and this is not the first executive action that the president has taken on on uh, firearms. As you say, they've sort of become uh, bolder and broader. As time goes on, uh, do you expect that we would see even more before the uh, end of this administration? I would suspect that if you do, you'll see it probably on the import side of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, the executive has a fair amount of latitude in terms of just unilaterally enacting various kinds of, of import restrictions. And they tend to frame those in ways of, you know, uh, in the sort of pseudo patriotic language, uh, you know, we don't want these dangerous foreign weapons being used to enrich evil foreign companies at the expense of, uh, you know, law abiding Americans and all that kind of stuff. So you'll probably see some of that. What really drives me crazy about all this stuff, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a gun guy, but I'm sort of more of a, more of a crime policy guy before I am that, is if you look at, you know, Chicago, you look at New York, you look at Los Angeles, you look at Houston, you look at Detroit and Washington, virtually all of the homicides, nine out of 10 of the homicides in those cities in any given year will typically be committed by someone with a previous record for a violent crime, often a felony conviction, and in Chicago especially, often a gun violation uh, already on their background. So, you know, the idea that you control crime by, you know, Clamping down on one particular kind of 223 ammunition that's, you know, rarely if ever used in a crime while doing nothing about the thing that we can do something about, which is better oversight, better parole, better probation, better monitoring for people who have violent offenses short of homicide or short of aggravated assault, who we know they are known to law enforcement, arrested, they've been charged, in many cases they've been convicted, Mm -hmm. and we could do a lot more on the control side of things by exercising degree of control over the people we already know are committing crimes. Uh, listen, I, I'm right there with you, Kevin. Uh, I think David Kennedy has, has uh, done some excellent work talking about this and pointing out where this has been done. Uh, it is, you know, look, it's intensive. I mean, that, that, that I think is the problem ultimately is that it requires you to get local, state, federal law enforcement involved. It requires some community support to do it effectively. Uh, and it may be, you know, look, it may be easier to just throw out that, uh, uh, that, that gun control bill or to take this executive action. It may be easier politically, but I, I think it is far 
I think it is useless in, in terms of actually combating uh, violent crime. Yeah, most of the evidence is. You know, if you've ever been to uh, a parole officer's office, you know, in a place like New York or a place like Houston, it's exactly what you expect from a government bureaucracy. It's exactly like the DMV. You know, you've got some bureaucrat who's being paid too much money, who's looking forward to his retirement, who has a number of things he has to check off. Now, doing real oversight, you know, real intervention in the parole and probation environment takes better people. It's very expensive to do. It probably costs more than actually keeping people locked up does in a, in a number of instances. On uh, doing the real work, not only of rehabilitation, which is something that I think should be part of the, the conversation, but also the work of simple, you know, simply monitoring people who have committed serious and violent crimes is very difficult and very expensive. You know, it's a lot easier to, you know, sit there and write tickets at a speed trap. It's a lot easier to, you know, monitor gun dealers who are by definition law-abiding people, so they're pretty easy to monitor, and the people they do business with who are also by definition law-abiding people, so they're pretty easy to monitor too. You know, it's a lot easier and less expensive to engage in law enforcement activities that are targeted at people who are already inclined to follow the law, who are pretty much by definition already law following, whereas the people who are inclined to violate the law, who are committing crimes to various kinds, you know, you have to do a lot of work to keep up with them. And as much as I, you know, admire and support a number of the police agencies and law enforcement agencies that I've worked with over the years, I think it's important to keep in mind that they are, at the end of the day, just another government agency, and they're plagued by the same sorts of problems every other government agency is plagued by, which is inefficiency, uh, lack of accountability, laziness, and, uh, and the fact that they often simply don't attract the very best people for the job. Talking with uh, Kevin Williamson from a National Review about his uh, piece, A Pincher Movement on Ammunition. Uh, uh, Kevin, uh, we've talked with some other folks like uh, Bob Owens from uh, BearingArms.com who said that uh, Congress could fix this uh, if, they, if, they, uh, if they wanted to, if they, if they can. At least they could get a bill to the president's desk. I, I won't say they could fix it, but they could get a fix to the president's desk uh, that would uh, just a simple change, uh, basically removing the word may, from the uh, Gun Control Act and uh, inserting uh, uh, designed for uh, use in a, a, a handgun, that that could fix this uh, overreach. I, I, you know, A, I don't know that the president would be likely to sign such a bill unless it were attached to some sort of, you know, spending bill or something like that. But uh, is this something that, uh, that Congress, uh, in your opinion, uh, should be taken on? Yeah, the next time that there is, um, you know, a Republican Congress or at least a, a gun-friendly Congress and a gun-friendly president, there are a lot of things like this. There are little things in legislation that need to be changed in order to reel in uh, the bureaucracies, which are totally unaccountable and, and tend to, to run amok. So, yeah, uh, this is one of those things that can be changed simply by revising one sentence in the Gun Control Act, and I think that, of course, should be done. I mean, the main problem you run into with is um, there's basically a contradiction at the heart of the gun control movement where they say we only want to go after, you know, guns that are a public danger and we don't want to do anything about, you know, hunting rifles and legitimate sporting guns, things like that. And the contradiction there, of course, is that as anyone who's handled guns knows is that the scary looking guns, you know, your AR-15s that are 223s and those sorts of things, are not anywhere near the most powerful guns on the market. The powerful guns, the most dangerous guns that we have on the market are sporting guns, are hunting rifles. Uh, you might survive getting shot by a 9mm. You're not going to survive getting shot by a 458. Uh, but that's a typical, you know, legitimate hunting rifle. I mean, those things are around. They've been around forever. You know, you've got these 19th, early 20th century models and calibers like the 4570 that are just enormous, powerful uh, weapons that are much more powerful than the stuff your average infantryman is carrying in the military or anything like that. So the idea that you're going to make the world safer, uh, that you're going to prevent the emergence or use of weapons that might defeat body armor, uh, while concentrating on AR-style rifles and exempting uh, hunting guns is just basically intellectually dishonest. So you either have to go all the way and say we're against guns categorically, including sporting rifles, including hunting rifles, and we're going after everything the way they did in the U.K., the way they've done some other places, 
Or you have to say, look, I mean, there are certain things that we thought we could do uh, in terms of gun control that just don't make any sense in the environment in which rifles and the uh, ammunition associated with them are going to be legal and widely available. I mean, you can go one way or the other, but they don't have the intellectual integrity to do one of those. Well, that's exactly right. Although um, every now and then you see hints of this, uh, you know, in the Sandy Hook, uh, Governor uh, Dana Malloy's Sandy Hook Advisory Commission report, uh, in their section on the gun laws that they think need to be implemented, not just across Connecticut, but around the country, uh, they say that we need to ban uh, all firearms that are capable of uh, firing more than 10 rounds without a, uh, a change of magazine. So, you know, in essence, go back to the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the repeating rifles of the uh, 1870s, <laughs> right. uh, and those should be banned. Every semi-automatic rifle, every semi-automatic handgun that could accept a magazine of more than 10 rounds, they believe that they, that should be banned. Now, I don't think they're likely to, uh, to, to get that, but again, at least in that case, perhaps, you can say, well, there is the, the intellectual honesty of them admitting uh, and acknowledging, yes, what we want are, are sweeping gun bans. Yeah. And, um, but again, you know, in terms of public safety, uh, these, they don't really know their history. You know, most people don't know that the worst school massacre ever carried out in the United States didn't involve guns at all. It was in the 19th century and involved bombs and dynamite. Uh, you know, there's dangerous stuff out there in the world. You look at Oklahoma City. This wasn't firearms. It was fertilizer. Uh, there is no way to regulate the world into such a sense of safety that people who mean to do malice can't do so, not if you're going to have a free society. So I think that um, the argument we need to keep making, and I think that this actually is working for us, is that the things that the people on the other side of the debate get excited about have very little basis in reality. It's mostly matters of aesthetics and emotion. So they look at an AR-style rifle and they don't see something that you use to shoot squirrels or coyotes or targets or that's kind of fun because it's configurable and modular and you can do lots of things with it. They see it and they think, you know, they think some 1980s Rambo movie, something like that. It's all, all about emotion. So I think that the main thing we can do other than to keep defeating them politically, which we've been doing a pretty good job of for the last 25 you know, years now, maybe a little bit more, is to continue as much as we can educating the public about the realities of, uh, of what different kinds of guns do. You know, we've still got a world in which most, and probably most of the people and a lot of the members of the media believe that fully automatic and select fire weapons are widely available, that you can go into Walmart and buy one and walk around and, you know, shoot up a shopping mall like it's a war movie. They don't understand the restrictions that are in there. They don't know the difference between automatic and semi-automatic rifles or handguns. And you get these absurd things where people saying, you know, this Glock can shoot 120 rounds in 10 seconds or something like that as though there were a 120 round magazine that's right. seven feet long or whatever it is. And the people just don't know this stuff. So the more we can get people familiar with the realities of, uh, of, of what different sorts of firearms are like, what they're used for, uh, what the differences and similarities are, then I think that a lot of the emotional leverage that you get on the other side will go away. Because when you hear armor-piercing bullet, what you think is, well, that's something that's designed to pierce armor. It sounds like a military or law enforcement thing. Mm -hmm. There's no legitimate reason a civilian should have an armor-piercing bullet. What you're really talking about here is a lead-free bullet that's designed to be used for hunting and to not put lead into animals that might thereby get passed on to carrying eaters or other sources in the environment. Yep, absolutely. Listen, Kevin, I appreciate you coming on the program, sir. It's fantastic talking with you, and hope we can do this again. Always a pleasure. Kevin Williamson joins us from uh, National Review right here on NRA News, Cam and Company.